I head up the Google Cloud security, performance, and test teams. Uh, I've been working on cloud for over two years now um, up in Seattle. And uh, don't let my title fool you. It says engineering manager, but managers at Google are different. Um, I really do get my hands down in the code. Uh, in fact, I checked something in last week, and about five minutes later, somebody on my team fixed it and checked in again. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've done a, I've done a bunch for cloud. Some of the things that are externally visible for cloud is I created the Google Compute uh, Google Compute uh, Engine units GCEUs, and we'll talk more about what Google Compute Engine is later. Um, we, you know, being the engineer I am, I thought, wow, GCEU, it's really cool. We should call that GQ, GQs because who doesn't want GQs? Or I mean, which engineer doesn't want to be GQ? And and now you know why I'm an engineer. Okay, great. <laughs> Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to talk about cloud computing. So I'm going to take a, a quick step back, talk a little bit about what cloud computing is. Um, I'll take you through some history about how we got to where we are today in, in 2013. This is you know, a history of cloud computing. Um, then I will definitely take you through the Google Cloud. I'll give you pivots of what the Google Cloud looks like, how we think about it, how the industry thinks about it. I'll run through a series of demos. Um, and then to prove I'm an engineer, I'm going to take you through the pitfalls. Uh, and this is how you know I'm not a marketing person because A, my slides are not pretty. Uh, and B, I'm going to tell you why things may not work for you from time to time. Um, and in the end, I'll just wrap it up with the, the team and questions. So with that, let's dive in. So what is cloud computing? It's a good question. I, I had this question two years ago. In fact, I probably still have this question today. Um, but one of the things that I did to try to figure out you know, what this industry is, is I started looking different places. You know, I go do web search, Google search. Um, I looked up at, you know, how stuff works, and they had a really interesting definition. They, they talk about remote machines owned by another company, and like maybe your email and word processing would be out there. And this seems like a really dated definition, but it's actually still fairly accurate. I did things like go out to um, conferences, because there's several conferences that happen throughout the year around cloud computing. And in there, you'll see interesting terms like Hadoop, um, you know, elastic environments, grid software. There's all these terms that, that start to pop up. I even went out and started to survey my peers at Google. Like, what do you think cloud computing is? And you can see down here, they start talking about, oh, it's this computation that you can do in the cloud. You don't have to worry about stuff. Um, so what I did is I said, okay, well, with any definition, let's pull together the properties of cloud computing. Because there are certain things we're hearing, you know, often in these definitions. You know, one was nothing, you know, nobody cares where it is. Um, everything's accessed over a network. So, you know, cloud computing is something that happens in the network. That's sort of like the beginning of, of what cloud computing is. The second part was, is a really uh, important part, which is utility. You could turn it on or off. Um, you pay for what you use, and when it's not on, you turn it off. It's like a light switch. So. If I want a database now, I, got, I have a database. And if I don't want a database in five minutes from now, I turn it off and I'm not paying for it. There's an elastic component where you know, resources grow and shrink on demand. And you've seen this uh, you know, many times across like YouTube scalability. We you know, uh, broadcast the Olympics. And like, whether one user is watching or 8 million users are watching, it all seems to work. And so there's this elastic component of the cloud that grows and shrinks on demand. For sure, it's programmable. Programmability is an important aspect of cloud. And then access control models. So here's where like, there's some pieces we'll talk about later where like software as a service versus you developing your own code in like, platform and infrastructure as a service layers where access models are different. There are some models where the end user owns the control, and there's some where the person providing the service owns the control. But there's some method of controlling access to data and resources. And you know, while not required, there's this thing that often comes up, which is multi-tenant. Your workloads run side by side with somebody else's. Some companies this can be concerning. You know, why is company A and company B running on the same server? We're competitors. We don't want our data anywhere near each other. Um, and it's really the cloud providers that create this partition or this barrier between those workloads. So there's no flow of data from one to the other. Um, and this is called multi-tenancy. So I try to be really smart. I'm like, OK, this sounds really good. So let me give a definition of cloud computing that tries to roll in like all these sources of information. And my definition is it's a set of programmable resources that are, that's pay per use. 
it happens over a network, it's elastic, and it removes the developer from having to worry about the hardware resources, the operating system, or all these minutiae that you know, she doesn't want to worry about, and she can just focus on delivering the application that she wants, and it's there, and it grows and shrinks on demand. So that's my definition. So that's cloud computing in a nutshell. So here's a, a little mini quiz. I'll just take a quick show of hands. I'm only going to go through a couple of questions to, to see if things are already resonating with everybody here. So is Gmail cloud computing? Yes. Um, it, it could depend on perspective. Um, one perspective is cloud, you know, Gmail is a hosted software service that companies can buy. You can buy Gmail, and for some nominal fee per month, you can host your mailbox there. So, in a, you know, on the upper end of software as a service, this is where Google started. Yes, Gmail, I would say, is cloud computing. Now, what about hosting Python applications? Is that, show of hands, is that cloud computing? Yes. Yeah, it has the programmable aspect we talked about. It's elastic. You know, this is where, like, Google App Engine enters the picture. Um, and here, let's try one more. Um, are physical, ser you know, servers hosted by a hoster, is that cloud computing? Yeah, it depends. Yeah, this is the one that gets sort of tricky is if, if you can on demand request these servers and have them go away on demand, then you sort of enter into the cloud computing versus just pure hosting. We tried this whole thing in the 90s called application hosting and server hosting. Um, and so what was, what's different today is this whole elastic component. And you might be thinking already, like, why is all this important? You know, why is this definition of cloud computing important? And so I asked that question, too, actually, like, why is this important? And so I went out and I found this Forbes article. And... I realized that not only can Google help you, you know, find dating sites, we can also help you on your dates, um, where it says, you know, some fake it to make it, where there's 17% of us apparently that on our first dates lie and tell people we know what cloud computing is. So, um, so I'm here to help you with your dating. That's really what this is all about. So, so cloud computing. Okay, so let's go back. <laughs> Uh, so let's go back and let's talk a little bit about history. So computers, they've been here for a while, almost 60 plus years now. Um, hard to believe we've lived with technology that long. Um, but in 1961, John McCarthy, also sort of dubbed as the father of AI, um, was living in a world where there were very few computers relative to today. There were 6,000 computers. And he had this thought. He said, you know, com computation one day will be a utility. For him, this was really important because there were so few of them and it was a constrained resource. Um, but it kind of made sense. He sort of was predicting the future that one day we would get to a utility. Now, the way we got there is very different than perhaps he expected. Um, but nonetheless, you know, some credit goes to, goes to him uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about, yes, computers could be a utility one day. But before we could get there, something had to happen. Um, we had to have the Internet happen. Um, we didn't have an internet in 1961. We had some sort of point-to-point -point stuff. You know, people were trying things out. Um, but it wasn't until 1969 that that ARPANET, the predecessor to the internet, happened. Um, and at the time, you know, transfer speed between computers was 50 kilobits a second. And to give you an idea of, like, what that actually means, because it's hard to sometimes think about all these bits, um, your cell phone's about 2,000 times faster than computers could talk to each other back in 1969. Some other things had to happen. We had to have the microprocessor revolution. That started, you know, roughly in 1971. And so after the, the microprocessor revolution, the Internet's kind of there. We have these acoustic couplers and modems. In the 80s, we have the BBS era. This is where, you know, you had laptops. They were called luggables. You'd carry them around like this. They are like 67 pounds or something like that. This is an uh, example is the K-Pro. Um, but something interesting happened where services started to show up, like CompuServe and Genie. And you would dial up, and for 10 cents a minute, you could access this super awesome service, and all you wanted to do was find out where the free BBS was, so you could go connect to this free thing and start to share, you know, files or data. Um, and so you'd go connect up to something like, you know, Koala Country, um, which was free. And so there was this whole sort of culture around the Internet starting to happen of, you know, connectivity, sharing, you know, data should be universally accessible. 
So, you know, roll time forward a little bit. So from the 80s, if that was our BBS era, um, we really needed the 90s to happen um, because these were pretty important to, to where we are today. So in 93, if you can believe it, this was the Mosaic browser was first to enter in the scene and make the Internet a lot more accessible. Prior to that, we'd all run like command line tools like Archie and all these things we hope to forget one day. Um, and users started showing up. And there were a few users. There were about 25 you know, million users connected up to, to the internet in 93, roughly. By 95, something interesting happened. We had 6 million hosts serving data on the internet. And so we had like 25 million users, and so you have to figure the users have grown a lot. And you'll see this on, on the next slide. Now, I'm sure I'm not going to pronounce his name correctly. So Ramath K. Chalapa, I apologize if you ever watch this video. Um, but this really smart guy was out there and, and gave what's often deemed to be the first definition of cloud computing, where Ramnath, he says, he says, cloud computing, he basically says that computing is going to be a paradigm where computing is determined not by, by technology, but by economic decisions. Yeah, look at that. Isn't that surprising? Yes, economic decisions. Uh, and, you know, when we were all really flush with cash in the late 90s, nobody was too worried about, you know, server rooms and the fact that, you know, 10% of, you know, the CPU, you know, CPUs we all owned were actually being utilized. 90%, you know, you know, unuse was just fine. We had plenty of money to run, you know, all the air conditioners and, and power. Um, but, you know, computing resources grew. 2000, we had 72 million hosts. And then um, by 2006, we had almost 4 million hosts um, on the Internet. And that is astonishing growth if you think how fast that happened. Um, and then the number of users that are using these also grew, which obviously drew the servers. And we had like 461 million users in 2001 using the Internet. Pretty astonishing. So um, 2006 was kind of a magic year. Um, this was the year where people like Eric Schmidt, um, our executive chairman of the board for Google, super smart guy, um, started to piece things together and started connecting together these ideas of like software as a service. In fact, um, by all my reading, he was deemed one of the first people to ever use the term cloud computing. Uh, because as I had mentioned before, in the 90s, we tried app hosting. Nobody wanted to hand over their data. Nobody wanted us to run their applications. But somehow, magically, in 2006, when you call it cloud computing, Everybody seemed a lot more comfortable, um, at least beginning to be comfortable with this idea. Um, and then also in 2006, uh, Amazon launched Amazon Web Services. And this was the first provider um, that was out there. And I, and I love this picture here because it's kind of like Amazon's the baby, you know, bright eyed, I'm new to the party. Um, and, you know, the older sister is really looking there like, hmm, didn't we try this in the 90s called application hosting? Uh, and as the way with technology, sometimes, you know, if you know nothing, you're, you're going to win because you're, you're just sort of looking at it from a different perspective. There's this whole notion of innovation cycles that you can read about that happen over and over again in technology. So um, where did Google enter the picture? So Google entered into this picture in 2008. We launched two things kind of simultaneously hitting different parts of helping to make the cloud happen. One part is we launched Chrome Beta which is astonishing because just recently it looks like Chrome has become the most popular browser in the world, and that's in like four years, which is astonishing growth. Um, but Chrome came out in beta, and Google App Engine, this place where you could host you know, Python and Java applications, came out. So we were trying to tackle the cloud from two parts. One was the usability end, where we were making the Internet easier to use with the browser, and we were starting to create a platform where you could actually create applications and host applications on the internet. Um, in 2010, we launched actually Google Cloud Storage. Um, I can't tell you the, the number of, you know, tera, exa, petabytes, whatever happened to be in cloud storage. I can tell you it's sufficiently big. So um, Google Cloud Storage is an object store in the cloud. It stores a ton of data. Um, there are many, many places you probably hit this, whether you go to a website and images show up or, or things like that. Um, but we had launched that service actually in 2010. Then 2011, we took App Engine out of beta. This is where you could tell Google was very serious in this market. We put down an SLA where we said, hey, we will guarantee certain sets of APIs will be around. We'll have a dep deprecation policy and so forth. Very important to all of us, you know, as developers and engineers, that if you're going to build it, 
um, it will still be there a year from now if you're betting your business on it. And then in 2012, last year, um, we shipped a couple of things. We shipped something called Google BigQuery, which is this amazing query technology. You can query, <coughs> excuse me, terabytes of data in a second. I know, that's astonishing. Um, we have hosted MySQL uh, in the cloud, and I'll talk more about this later. And we launched um, Google Compute Engine, which is our virtual machine offering in the cloud. And I, I noted here that it's limited preview. Google differentiates here. Limited preview means there are workloads in production. People are paying us. Um, and we are happy to have you come and try Compute Engine. But we're just not going to open up the doors you know, fully open just yet. But we are happy to, to help you use it. Um, beta is different. Beta means we're not totally sure. Maybe it's going to change and so forth. Um, and this is something that has kind of confused the market a little bit, where people think, oh, you have Compute Engine, but it's in beta. Actually, it's in limited preview. People are paying us money to use the service. And then, so we go through this whole history, and then I learned something new from Eric. So we learned, like, all this technology stuff. And I thought I was really smart with my definition of cloud computing, but it takes somebody like Eric to really bring it home. He goes, you know, I'm not sure anybody knows what cloud computing is, but I do know one thing. It's a marketing term. So there you go. It's a marketing term. So if anybody asks you what cloud computing is, you can confidently now answer. Um, it's important to my dating, and it's a marketing term. So let's talk about the stack. Um, and oftentimes, cloud computing is thought of as a stack, a set of sort of tiered services from, from the lower level, which is called infrastructure as a service, IAAS, which is maximal flexibility and maximal complexity. This means you're your own administrator. You have to have your own backup plans, retention plans. It's a lot of work. In fact, a lot of times it's sort of perceived as the IIS layers like taking the server from underneath your desk and like sticking it up in the cloud, whatever that means. Um, hold that thought. Ask me that later. <laughs> um, somebody said without, without their privacy. Actually, I, I disagree with that, but I'll tell you why I disagree with that later. And I'll show you some of the things that Google is doing to be very, very, very careful about end user data. Um, and I'll talk about some of the messages around that. But infrastructure as a service is is really kind of the thing we're familiar with. It's interesting, whenever I've given talks about this next layer up called platform as a service, a lot of people ask me where the server is. The platform as a service tier tries to remove the user from this infrastructure layer, but you have a different programming model. And in fact, it's very hard for um, developers to think in this model, but if you can get into this model, it's very powerful. And then at the top of this tier, and I'll go through each of these a little bit more, is software as a service. This is where you have things like, you know, Google Drive, Google Docs, you know, Google Spreadsheets, Gmail, YouTube, all these things that you can use um, at the service layer. You can even build on top of them. They are programmable. You can put, you know, JavaScript into your, your Google Spreadsheets, and you can pull data from the lower tiers in the infrastructure layer up, and there's all these examples out there that allow you to do this. It's super cool. Um, but that's the software as a service tier at the top. What's interesting about SaaS is it's less less flexible, but it's lower complexity. So it's easier to use, but you you don't have perhaps all the controls you want. So there's trade-offs at each of these layers. So let's talk about each one um, just a little bit more, and then I will take you into um, how the Google pieces plug into these tiers. So infrastructure as a service layer. Um, as I mentioned, these are the building blocks. These are the pieces that we know today, where we talk about storage. Like, I, got, I have disks. We talk about you know, computing resources. I have machines. We talk about databases. I have databases. Um, and this is the layer where a very thin layer will come on top of it. It allows you to access it over the cloud. But it looks familiar. Um, I'll show you an example later of Compute Engine, where we can log into Google Compute Engine. It's a machine in the cloud. I get a you know, a Unix prompt, and I can do stuff like configure web servers or run computational workloads, whatever I want to do on it. <laughs> uh, there's some terms here, too, that you, you can you watch out for at the infrastructure layer. Because there is all this decision-making to be made, there's this notion of zones. Like, where, where are these resources? Um, and so are they in the US? Are they in Europe? Where do I want them to be? How do I have disaster recovery? Um, and so, yes, all this complexity suddenly enters in at this layer. Platform as a service is different. So this is things like Google App Engine, um, Salesforce.com, Amazon Elastic Beanstalk, and so forth. There's lots of, of examples of these out there. Um, but this is a different model. 
This is where you can't just take the code that you've always written and just suddenly put it in the cloud. Some amount of rewrite, some amount of rework is going to happen in the platform layer. But what you get for it is you get like authentication models. Somebody else will handle verifying who the user is that's using your application. You'll get services like Data Store, aka Google Big Table, where you have like, you know, infinite key value pair lookup and it's redundant and reliable. You have things like, you know, versioning control where you can do experiments. Like I want to deploy only 1% of my users onto my new software versus 99% on my old software. And as I'm confident that my new bits work, I can actually kind of move the dial over. And these systems in the background are automatically moving users to these different servers and services. So you've given up some flexibility around configuration and control, but you've gained a whole lot more around scalability. And then there are, you know, obviously test services and payment systems and things that you can integrate in at this level. Is all of this resonating so far with everybody? Okay, good. Then we have the last layer, um, which is the software as a service tier. This is actually where Google started. It's very interesting. Different companies have taken different approaches to cloud. Um, Google has sort of come from the top down. We started with software as a service, things like, you know, Gmail and search and all these other things move down into the platform layer with Google App Engine and further down with these infrastructure components I'll show. Um, other, you know, others in the industry started differently and fundamentally their design points are different where they started at the infrastructure layer and moved up and you can sort of see this permeate through their architectures. Um, and then, you know, even a third one, which I, I can't name, but sort of started in the middle um, and sort of moved out from the platform layer kind of up and down, which was probably perhaps one of the hardest points to start at. So um, software as a service layer, um, you're, you have a model around computation and code, but you get capabilities like I want to run a query on a terabyte of data, but the data has to be structured a particular way, for example. Um, you have things like Google Translation Service and, and other things at this layer. So reduced you know, complexity, the least complex, but the least flexible. So how does this look for Google? And how do we, how do we sort of shape across these tiers? Um, just one quick segue. The language of cloud, there's basically two languages of cloud. There is uh, REST and JSON and SOAP and XML. Every provider out there speaks one of these two languages. Google made a set of choices. I'll talk about those um, in a minute. Really around REST and JSON. We wanted you know, simple simplicity um, you know, and less statefulness. Um, but there are different languages of the cloud. These are important. These will impact you know, how you actually develop your software. So Google, where are we? Here's how Google layers across these services. Yes, I realize this is a little bit of an eye chart for those in the back of the room. So hopefully you have like 2010 vision. Um, but I will walk you through these and, and give you a little bit of an explanation of, of these technologies. Um, and certainly we can talk more about these later. I actually have demos of a couple of them. So I will definitely be doing the demos. So where do we start? So at the bottom tier, we have um, the infrastructure is a service. So we have Google Cloud SQL. This is hosted MySQL in the cloud. Um, so if you use MySQL, SQL Server, any other sort of you know, Oracle, SQL-based language, um, MySQL will look very familiar to you. The data types are familiar. The syntax is familiar. Um, you know, SQL 99 or whatever type syntax. Um, and in the cloud, you get this service. And so whether you're programming an app engine, compute engine, or even outside of the Google Cloud, you have a database. It looks like a database, right? And you can run queries and put data in and, and run transactions and so forth. What's unique about the Google Cloud, the Google Cloud SQL that's different than others is, the, is our monetization model, the way you pay for it. You, all, you We have two models. One is you can sort of get a subscription model. The other is you can pay per use. And so for like 10 cents an hour, you can have a 100 gigabyte database or something like that. And when you're not using it, it automatically shuts down for you. When you go and you run a query, we'll automatically spin up your database, attach it to it, and let your query complete. I don't know of anybody else in the industry that gives you that level of flexibility um, for, for their SQL service. So that's actually pretty cool. By the way, I spent my whole career in like these infrastructure layers all the way up. So what's totally cool to me is not always cool to others. Right? That's my nerd humor. I spent my whole time doing operating systems. I think operating systems are cool. Can we save one bit? Most people are like, one bit? Why do I even care one bit? Like, I got more bits on my phone than I, like, all existed in, you know, 1961. Um, anyway, 
So um, to the storage layer. So Google Cloud Storage has been around for a while. It's growing. We've added capabilities like uh, static web hosting into the, into the service. So you can serve web pages out of here. We were one of the first companies to support cores. This is like cross-origin request, you know, request or whatever, where you can say, oh, this server can request data from Google Cloud Storage and make it look as though it's coming from my own site. And so this fixes a lot of permissions problems when you build um, applications on the internet. We have some really cool new features um, that are probably not supposed to talk about um, that will be coming uh, down the road here with this, which makes it a lot easier. We added a file API into App Engine, so it's easier to manipulate files um, in Google Cloud Storage. So we continue to innovate quarter after quarter, week after week. You know, new bits are, are shipped. Um, it's astonishing that we'll ship basically new kernels every week in, in Compute Engine. I don't know anybody else that, that does that um, at that speed. Um, and so with that, Compute Engine is our virtual machine offering in the cloud. Uh, we offer a couple different versions of, you know, OSs. They um, look very familiar, and we'll log in. Um, you have different images you can choose. At uh, some point, we'll let you, you know, upload your own kernels and, and very interesting stuff. Um, but it's, you know, we have data centers all around the world that allow you to host VMs, and I'll, I'll show you that. Um, so that's our infrastructure as a service layer. Very cool, growing. There's more that will be coming. Um, in the coming weeks, months, and, and years in that, in that layer. The platform as a service um, is like Google App Engine, which has been around for a while, and we continue to innovate services. And we're, we're always trying to find ways to better blend like programmability of, inside of App Engine with Compute Engine so you can start to move your code more flexibly between the, the different services. Um, we're getting better at that. Uh, App Engine, you know, has different models of computation. You can host Python code, Java code, Go code up in the cloud. It'll scale up or scale down. Um, it integrates directly with the services down below. So whether you're pulling objects or queries, um, you can also, you know, have workloads run over inside of Compute Engine. And I'll show you a demo that uses um, Google App Engine as a front end for hosting like the website and the kind of the interaction of the data model with Compute Engine where we're doing some scalable computation. Um, we have some other things that are coming. Um, I discovered that there is this thing out there called Google Endpoints. Um, it's in trusted tester mode. Like, I, I thought it was safe to put it on this slide because I, like, typed this in and it showed up on Google, so must be okay. Um, <clears throat> so that's the engineering perspective, by the way. Um, but this is where we're trying to make it easier for you to develop services. So we give you this API layer that handles things like authorization and, and authentication and payments and allows like mobile phones and end browsers to send requests into your service. You handle the, you know, the request and you send back a response. Um, and so if you've used you know, Google Maps APIs or these other APIs, they are actually this type of Google endpoints layer um, that we use internally and now we're gonna offer that externally. And then moving up the stack into the software as a service tier, we have uh, Google BigQuery and this is our um, service where you can upload terabytes of data, run a SQL query, and the answer will come back in seconds. Um, the first time you do this, it's actually quite astonishing. Uh, I grew up building like SQL Server technology and, and things like that in, in years past, and databases could never do this. Uh, I was astonished the first time I did it. Um, and then, you know, most people are probably familiar with things like Translate. Um, if you build front-end web pages and you want to get a Google assessment on the performance of your page, and how to optimize it. We have services like Google PageSpeed you can actually go use. Um, we have uh, a set of sort of artificial brain models. Anybody see that we took like 10,000 CPUs, went out and trained it on every video on YouTube, and, and what did it learn to do? Anybody know? Yeah, this, it learned all about cats. I'm a dog guy, I was kind of offended. Um, but we have the Google Prediction API, which does a lot of that. It sees AI models in the cloud where you can train them with sets of data, ask for answers, and then it'll give you a prediction of what's there. It also does linear regression models and, and lots of other interesting things. Um, and of course, at the top is Docs. I mentioned Docs on this slide um, because Docs can integrate with all these other tiers um, through this like Google Endpoints set of APIs um, that we expose out. So everything we expose we have is a RESTful API, and, and Docs can actually program around these, whether it's in the spreadsheets or forms or other areas. It's actually pretty cool. So how does Google view the cloud? So this is, by the way, this last slide, this was how the industry views cloud. They think of it as this tiered model of infrastructure, platform, and software as a service. Google, we kind of think of it differently, though. We think of it as apps. There are a set of things that, that we've built that you use. 
Um, and then we have these other buckets of how we think about the cloud platform. Um, we certainly think about how do you build your front end stuff, like you know websites and apps, you know whether it's in your mobile phone or you know Android apps, whatever they are. We kind of have this part that we think about as apps. We think about your data. Um, data is very important, and this is where privacy of your data is extremely important. Uh, we are one of the first cloud providers out there to have encryption at rest, so all data in Google Compute Engine is encrypted, and we're taking that same uh, meme and value to the rest of our Google Cloud. So um, that basically means there is a key. We don't really have your key. You lose your key, your hose, because you're not going to get your data back. But there's probably one engineer who's highly audited somewhere that could get the key. Um, but it's very, very, very controlled. Um, so we think about storing your data. We think about computation at scale. We're very interested in scientific workloads. Um, and we've done all kinds of interesting things like, you know, genomics, you know, video rendering, uh, and so forth. Uh, there's been some really great articles that are written about our computational capabilities, and those are out there. And then, of course, you know, analyzing your big data, um, which, is, which is a problem. But, you know, if you have terabytes of data, actually, how do you analyze it? Um, there's another interesting problem, which is I have terabytes of data. How do I get it into the Google Cloud? Turns out we, I know, I don't really want to admit it. You can send us a disk. Uh, not everybody's internet is like Google's internet. But once it's in the Google Cloud, it's extremely fast. Yes, but you can send us a disk, and we will actually upload it in, into the cloud for you. So this is more of the Google model. We think about apps, computation, you know, data, and analyzing the data. So what did we do to build cloud? So there are a bunch of principles and properties that we've really held to, um, which are security. And by security, I mean security and privacy. We, we are highly, highly audited. There's hardly, there, there's nothing that I can think of that can be touched in cloud that isn't audited. So if somebody has touched a piece of data, it's known who it was, when they did it, how long they touched it, for what purpose they did it, um, and we have a very tight set of audited controls. Um, and you'll see more about you know, audit processes and, and other things later in the year. Um, we have a strong auth model. So we chose this auth model called OAuth2. Um, it's a little complicated from the developer end, which is why we've uploaded to GitHub a bunch of code samples, like how to program the Google Cloud. So if you want to use Cloud SQL or Compute Engine or, or whatever else, um, we've put a bunch of example apps out there. But there's some cool properties of OAuth2, which is like revocable access. If you give somebody an access token, you can actually go in and just revoke access to that access token, which is something that's important. So Because once you've given somebody access to an app, you want to be able to revoke it at some point. You don't want them to have, you, they've got your key and they always have your key. That, that's a problem. All two has other things like time limits. Like you may look at the data for the next five minutes and after that you can't get it. And so you see things like that show up in our storage tier where we'll give you at least five minutes to pull the image and after the five minutes you can't see it anymore. Um, and so while there's some slight complexity for developers there, there's a lot of power that comes um, for security around that. Consistency was a second meme we've held. I'm actually very happy to see the, the blogs picking up on this, where they go out and they say things like, Google Compute Engine is the most consistently performing, you know, virtual machine in the cloud. Like, if I'm getting, you know, 100 IOPS to second to disk now, I see it now, tomorrow, no matter how much seems to be running, the, the workload seems to run exactly the same time and time again. That, that is extremely hard to do, but something we value a lot is the consistency. Um, open and flexible. We're giving all the examples out. In fact, all of our UI that I'm going to show you later, um, you can develop all of these UI yourself. This is something that we've, we've held as a principle. We want people to build on cloud from all layers, whether it's the management orchestration layer all the way up. Um, and then, um, yes, we have code. And I'm a security guy, so I try to use some lead speak on you there. Yeah. We has code. I tried to trick you. Um, and then proven. So we actually do use all these services today ourselves in production. Um, Google is one of the few companies I've, I've ever been at where we actually use all the, all the things that you use. We don't use anything different. We use the same things, um, which is very cool. So we prove the technology, and we won't ship it until it's ready. So I sometimes get the question, why the Google Cloud? Well, that sounds all great, Tony. You know, you have security, you have like consistency, you have all these tiers, offerings everywhere. I can write my mobile apps and host them in the back end cloud. You know, why Google though? Well, we know something about data centers. Um, if you haven't gone and done the, the virtual tour of the Google data centers, you should. Um, go out to Google and type Google data centers. It's phenomenal. 
Uh, we have, you know, powerful machines, networks, services, geolocated all over the world. Um, we've been running these services, obviously, for a long time. And we're really taking the best of what we have and, and allowing the world to actually use Google as their computer. And so um, why, why Google? Um, because we care and we listen. Uh, we take the feedback. You know, every time I've gotten feedback, within weeks or months, we've, you know, we've actually acted on the feedback. Um, so as you use the Google Cloud, please do send us feedback. We really do listen. So um, why Google? Because we listen and we have the experience to run these big data centers. So some demos. This is one of my favorite parts here. So I'm going to do a couple demos. First, I'm going to take you to the Cloud Console. I'm going to click on a web page. That's going to be a very sophisticated demo. Um, but then I'll take you through very briefly some App Engine demos. Um, but I'm going to spend a bit more time on Compute Engine and show you some of the power of you know, what um, fully generalized computation in the cloud looks like. Uh, we will spin virtual machines up in Europe. Um, so while we're getting close to sleeping, um, they're wide awake. And so we're going to go spin up some machines over there. Um, and then um, I'll just kind of round things out after this. So with that, the Cloud Console. And by the way, I close all my email. So if anything personal shows up, start laughing. So I know to close the window very fast. Yeah. It's very likely to happen. Um, so cloud, um, it's all together now. So if you go to cloud.google.com, um, you can actually try all of these things that I've been talking about here. Um, you can see different sets of customers that we have. You can click into um, computing at scale. You can go and learn more. Um, you can dig through this. I'm not going to spend very much time on this. In fact, I'm just going to go dive into some of the other demos. But we have an amazing amount of help um, out here. If there are examples you don't see, examples you want, really, like I said, please send us feedback and I'll take you through it. So cloud.google.com, that's your starting point for all of cloud. So if you walk out of here with anything, um, three things, know that we're helping with your dating because like, you need to know this stuff. Um, cloud.google.com is what you want and we care about security and privacy. Um, so that's demo number one, there's cloud.google.com, which a year ago didn't even exist. So let me go back here. And you can tell I've done demos before because just in case it didn't come up, there it is. Okay, so cloud. So let's go talk about App Engine. So App Engine is our platform as a service tier at Google. Um, this is the thing that automatically scales up and scales down uh, dynamically for you. Um, it's where you can host your, your data. It has lots of services you can use to build interesting things like um, we have an XMPP service where you can go do like live chat and at the back of your chat, you can have a robot trying to predict what the answer is. And so you've probably experienced this somewhere on the internet where you're typing into, you know, oh, I need help with my flowers. And it comes back and it says, oh, here, have you done these things? Um, it, it's very likely it could be an App Engine app um, using this XMPP protocol out there. Um, app Engine, as I said, started out in 2008. And you can just see, like, the phenomenal growth um, that has happened with App Engine. And year after year after year after year, we've added services to make it easier to develop interesting applications. Um, that are out there. We have um, customers across many different tiers for App Engine. And this is to give you an idea of the scope of how App Engine is used. Um, clearly, line of business apps at the bottom, business apps. Um, lots of businesses use us. In fact, you probably hit an App Engine app and didn't know it. Um, at the consumer tier, we have companies like Khan Academy. And there's a bunch of other really cool ones I wish I could, could have talked about, um, but I can't. But, you know, mobile gaming is out there, lots of mobile gaming. In fact, the biggest um, mobile gaming vendors out there you can think of are all using the Google Cloud in, in one way, shape, or fashion. Um, and then on the mobile tier, we have, you know, like news readers like Symperium, you have Pulse and others. Um, and so App Engine, you know, obviously has some um, big usage in terms of uh, the number of users or something like, 7.5 billion hits over a million applications on App Engine um, being hosted 24 by 7. And we have a 99.95% reliability. Um, and we're trying to drive that up you know, all the time. So, um, so that's App Engine. So let me go, go pop in and do my, my two little sample apps. So I actually went out. Um, if you go and you look, if you Google appspot.com, um, AppSpot are actually all App Engine hosted apps. So if you want to see who else is sort of out um, hosting apps on App Engine, you can go to an App, an app Spot search. I found this one, which was kind of geeky because we're all developers here. 
which is called shell.appspot.com, which gives you a thin interface to Python, so you can program Python in the cloud and, you know, do like everybody would want to do, which is, you know, oh, have a typo. That's, that's me. I'm not a very, whew, there, print Tony. Uh, I have taken over the internet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, but that's an example app, right? Like you may have apps that are programming apps. There's other, obviously, you know, much more sophisticated vendors out there doing cloud development and, and they're using App Engine. I found this other site which was called Beat the Boot. This is the, uh, this was a, a Chrome site that Google had built where you could actually go um, and try to play games to see how fast you could do things. Um, you know, how much faster you were uh, than Chrome and booting. And, and I was failing miserably. But this is all hosted on App Engine. The back end data tier, um, the front end, you know, presentation. And I believe that this one was, I'm supposed to race it in brushing teeth or something like that. Um, and, and clearly Chrome beat me. So, uh, there you have it. You can, you can write games on App Engine. Yes. It's very sophisticated. Okay. Um, and then the demos that I wanted to spend a little bit more time on were are actually Compute Engine. And so Compute Engine is one of our newest offerings. We launched this last year at Google I.O. It's in limited preview. Um, and so a few short facts about um, Compute Engine, and then I'll do the demos, which is um, these are some of the things that people are saying about App in, or, uh, Compute Engine here. And what I like about this site here, this was like a genomics site. And if you go back and watch the Google I.O. launch, it shows you, like, differences between... You're trying to do this locally on your workstation where gene association takes about 30 days per, per association on like powerful workstations in your office. And on Compute Engine, we're doing associations like every kind of five seconds. So it fundamentally changes the way research is done. Um, we, in the last uh, six months since we shipped this, we've beaten the TerraSort uh, record on Compute Engine. So a partner of ours, Map, it, uh, Map R, uh, they did this analysis where they were looking at, like, why would you want to move to the cloud? Like, what's the economics of the cloud, and how is it different? And so they went out, and they did a TerraSort, and they said, well, what would it take to build a TerraSort? Like, if I was going to go build a set of machines, what would it look like? And so they, they did this one thing where it's like, okay, we'll need roughly 1,500 servers, 12,000 cores. Um, it takes a lot of planning investment. It's going to take us about $6 million, roughly, to build this, this data center that in a minute could sort your data. Or, optionally, um, in 53 seconds, um, you can sort your data on Compute Engine and at a cost of $500. And by the way, the $500 will let you do it 60 times um, because it's like 13 and a half cents a minute per core. Multiply it out. You, you, know, you pay by the hour there. Um, so in 60, you could sort 60 times for $554. Um, cloud is completely changing the economics of how we think about building software, um, bar none. Um, here's a video of the TerraSort happening. Um, this was produced by, by MapR. And what they're doing here is they're actually kicking off a script that's programming to the REST APIs on the, on the back end for Compute Engine. Um, they're pushing, you know, software into the nodes, telling, you know, the, you know, map to go do the, the map reduce, go do the sort. The red are CPUs that are fully engaged. The green are the idle. And, this is what a sort actually looks like computationally wise. It's pretty cool. It almost looks like the game of life where all the CPUs are engaged and then subsets and subsets and subsets. And there you have it, um, a, a Terra sort in seconds. So let me go give some actual live demos here quickly. Um, so one is this. So we actually have a UI um, for, uh, for spinning up and shutting down machines in Compute Engine. And so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually create an instance. I'm going to call it NYC because it's New York. Uh, like I said, I have a couple choices of where I can spin up machines in the world. I can go to the middle of the U.S., the East Coast, or somewhere in Europe. So I'm going to go to Europe. Uh, I'm going to ask for a two-core CPU, and I'm going to tell it to go kick that off. And so um, one of the things that you'll see in Compute Engine is the first stage of booting a virtual machine is called provisioning. This is where we go look in the data center, figure out what physical host we could host um, the virtual machine on. Once we figure out where it can be placed, we place it. Then we go into this mode, which is called staging. And that's what you see happening right now. This is like, oh, I have to boot an image. It's an operating system that I need. Let me pull this operating system down to my host. 
let me tell my machine about the operating system, and then let me actually start booting the operating system. Now, what's interesting about Europe is the image takes a little bit longer um, because currently the images are, are mostly hosted other places than next to those data centers. And so um, it's booting, and then now it's transitioned into this mode called running. This machine means the machine is on. It's powered on now. So somewhere in Europe right now, I started up a machine. Um, so I just used my 14 cents. Um, and so I'm going to go make use of my, my 14 cents here. So I'm going to switch into the into the uh, command line here. So let me do one thing. I will attempt not to type my password in for you. Okay, so, so what I'm doing here is I actually have a workstation. I have a developer workstation um, in Kirkland that I actually logged into here. Uh, because I needed some gateway to get into my machine. Like I said, this is infrastructure as a service layer. Somehow you have to get into the machine. You know, you can, you can, you know, get an X terminal to it or, or whatever else. I'm a developer. I'm going to go to the command line. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go SSH into this machine that's in Europe. And I'm going to use the, um, set of, uh, local command line tools that we have for Compute Engine. So we have command line tools for all of these different, um, services. This is called GCUtil. So, Google Compute Util. Um, I have a project. And so one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to say list all the instances that are out running um, for me as a user. And I wish I could, wish I could. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Actually, what it really doesn't like is the fact that, yeah, I have two mistakes here. No pressure, no pressure. Live typing. Okay. Now I'm definitely sure I'm running. Um, and and uh, I know it's a little hard to see in the back, but here what you can see is I actually have a machine that's booted. Um, it is this NY machine, two cores, tells you what image it is, gives me an external IP address. Um, one of the things I can do with the tool, though, is I can just say SSH into NYC, which is my machine, um, and the tool will automatically look up the IP address and get me in. And so here I am actually logged into a server in Europe running in a Google data center, um, which, like I said, for an infrastructure guy is very cool. So, yay, it actually worked. So now let me give you a more visual um, kind of depiction of what this looks like. So for Compute Engine, I showed you the front end UI. So there's this UI here. Um, I can click on the machine, NYC. It tells me where it is. I showed it to you running inside the um, command line. So I could actually get command line access, and now I can configure apt-get, run all my software, have full programmability. Um, but here's a slightly different demo. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to spin up 16 virtual machines. Um, and this is an App Engine app front-end hosted application. And what it will do is, as it starts to go through the provisioning stage, you'll see green. Um, so we have gone off and we told 16 servers to boot. Um, we're 13 seconds in. Machines are already in this provisioning stage. Then they get the staging. And then when they're green, that means they're fully up and ready to go. Um, my coworkers will often show this with, like, a 1,000 nodes. Um, and it takes about the same amount of time, actually, to start a 1,000 nodes. Roughly under a minute, we could start up a 1,000 machines. So there's now uh, 12, 16 machines out there um, that are running on my behalf somewhere in the world. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what this looks like visually to have this powerful computation at your fingertips. So here's a fractal generator. On the left side is a single CPU doing computations. On the left side are the 16 virtual machines I just spun up in the world. And if I click in one of these, watch carefully. They'll both zoom, but start to look at the details. So I'm going to zoom fairly quickly into this, this one on, on the left. Watch the resolution differences of these two images, OK? Here we go. So if you look, this one is very blocky and fuzzy. That one over there with 16 nodes is already computed you know, seconds you know, before this one over here. And so here we actually have an application running in App Engine using Compute Engine as a background processor, 
literally with these, you know, CPUs in the background doing the computation. And you can see with, you know, even 16 processors, it's maybe shaved, I don't know, half the time off or three quarters of the time. A thousand CPUs, this would just be just like this. I could literally fly right into the, right into the fractal. So there you have an integrated demo of App Engine and Compute Engine working together. And since it's getting late, I'm going to start to wrap this up. So there are some demos of cloud. Um, but as I said, I would give you the pitfalls. Um, so it's kind of like when the dog grabs your sock and won't come back. There are pitfalls in cloud. Um, needless to say, when the dog gives back that pink sock, I'm sure it's going to be wet. So what, what to watch out for in cloud? One is cloud is interesting. The, compu the, the monetization models are typically you know, by the hour, by the day, by the month. Um, you have to be a little careful. It does feel a little bit like you know, death by a thousand cuts, where every day you go spend just a dollar, and at the end of the month you're like, whoa, where did I spend $3,000 on this credit card bill? You have to watch out for this with cloud. We are trying to do things at Google to make this easier, more predictable, um, but we're not there yet. right? So just be thoughtful of the services you're using. Um, as you move from the infrastructure as a service layer to the software as a service layer, there's more lock-in. Remember I said it's easier to do these things, but it also means you're sort of more locked in. All of us as developers worry about lock-in. Um, Google is worried about this for you too, and we've done a lot to make sure you can get your data out. Um, we have this whole effort called the data liberation front. Any data that Google has, you can export it. Um, there are other things that we're also um, doing here to make people feel more comfortable about using the value-added services without feeling locked in. Um, location matters. Uh, there are different geopolitical rules, um, different governments. Depending on what you build, you have to pay attention to location. If you start a virtual machine in Europe, you may be subject to European laws. Um, so while it's very easy for me to start it and use this thing, um, depending on data retention policies and so forth, you have to be familiar with those laws. So while it's super easy to do, um, doesn't mean you're sort of divorced from having to understand the legal end of things. Um, so that's kind of a gotcha. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of disasters happen, right? Like Christmas, we couldn't play videos, and you know you hear about things. Um, but what I want to say is, it's really hard to to keep cloud services running, um, but it's even harder to run them yourselves. Um, I've been there, and and so you don't have to take my word for it. Build your own data center, run it for a year, and then when you're done, please come to Google, and we will help you use our data center. Um, it, it will be better for you. Um, so there are pitfalls out there. So with that, um, people ask me a lot of times, where does the team come from? Um, so where else would you build uh, the cloud than in the cloudiest city in the world, which is uh, Seattle Kirkland? Um, in fact, almost all the cloud providers are up there. Um, we actually tell everybody it's really cloudy all the time in Seattle. So I had to sort of synthesize this picture with some clouds, but this is actually Mount Rainier in the background um, going over the I-90 bridge here. Trust me, it doesn't look like this ever, ever. It rains all the time. Please stay in New York. Um, <clears throat> The second biggest location for cloud is San Francisco, followed by Mountain View. Um, and as Ari had mentioned, we actually have a team here in New York that's actually building cloud, which is super cool. So we have sort of 24 hours of coverage. We actually have a team in India and in Hyderabad. We also have one in, in Sydney, Australia, that are helping keep, a, you know, keep these services up you know, 24 by 7 for you. Um, and with that, um, I hope you learned what cloud is. I hope your dating is successful. And thank you for coming to Google. And I'm happy to take questions. You don't have to stay because this is probably the last call for the beer. But if people have questions, I'll be up here. You know, feel free. We can answer questions. So or not. Yeah, I, I think we can do. Um, so the question is, are there Google services running on Google? Um, yes. In fact, a lot of the properties that are out there um, are, are running on Google. I actually checked with marketing, and unfortunately, they like threw these golden handcuffs on me. So I'm not allowed to talk about it. But there are uh, open source, you know, you know, build servers, and like, you know, all kinds of interesting things are built on cloud now. Um, inside of Google, there's not a single line of business app that isn't built on App Engine these days. Um, in fact, a lot of our external apps are built that way, too. Um, so, yeah, we are definitely using the services we're building, you know, day in and day out. Our business depends on it.
I have a question about the redundancy and just uh, pitfalls. Like you said, things do happen. If I were to get a virtual, dedicated virtual host, uh, if I would go to the hosting company and try to figure out what kind of redundancy they have, all these backup failover things, how do you guys handle things like that? I've used Amazon in the past. So like you said, everything is pay as you go. You start up your machines, but think if something does happen, how, how are you guys pretty transparent in uh, trying to figure out what happened and just work with customers? Yeah, so the question was, like, how transparent is Google? We're, we're very transparent. I'll actually show you a, a quick example. So one of the things you can do with the API um, that is super useful, so let me get out of this VM. We actually have something that said that um, if you look at the tool, this tool here, we actually publish things like our downtime that we're going to have on our servers through the API. So if we think that there's a service outage that's coming, we'll actually um, go list that. And I was going to uh, see if I could find it here. It's um, yeah, get get PCR. It's like get the let's see here, delete. Check. I guess my question was more in particular, like Amazon. Had, some of their regions have been down in the past unexpectedly. So if my service is in the middle of doing a bunch of computations and one of the regions happens to affect that, or do you guys work closely with customers specifically to try to figure out what happened? Yeah, so for failover and disaster recovery, yes. I mean, there are things that we're going to do I can't talk about today um, because they're not released yet that will help with these disaster recovery scenarios. Right. Um, we're very cognizant of this. If you noticed, I was talking about, oh, there are multiple zones out there in terms of where you can actually start um, services. And so the fact that we have like two zones in Europe tells you something about redundancy. So we're building this level of redundancy in. There are certain things that you know um, customers will want at some point, like load balancers and failover and automatic restart. Um, today it's a little bit more self-service. Um, you know, we will get there. Uh, specific individual customers, we're happy to share our Google experience on how we've actually done it successfully and how we've like scaled up and, you know, kept search and, um, you know, docs and all these services running 24 by 7. Um, that's one of the benefits of actually working with Google is we give a lot of insight um, into actually how we do that and how to sort of create your environments, which is why I also talk about the pitfalls of disasters are going to happen. If you put everything in a single zone and there is a, you know, a planned outage or a unplanned outage, um, yes, you're going to have a problem with your application. Don't do that, right? Like today, don't do that. The alternative is to use something like App Engine, which will automatically migrate and move around failures for you, which is why you sort of move up to this next tier. And then you might start asking, well, could you do that for virtual machines? And, and then I can't say anything. Thank you. So. Can you hear me? Yeah. So okay. I serve large evil enterprises, so my question is twofold. First of all, are there plans for a private or hybrid enterprise cloud? Um, so the first question is, is there plans for uh, a hybrid cloud? And what this means um, is typically part of the cloud is in the Google data center. The other part is hosted locally. This means that there's generally a VPN service, you know, an encrypted channel um, into Google. We actually have some documentation today on how to do this with things like App Engine apps. Um, Talk to us more. I'll talk to you, and I, I can't say anything here, but we can talk more. Uh, okay. But it, it makes a lot of sense to allow these hybrid models to exist. So the second question is, what operating systems are going to be supported in the future for the compute engine? Um, the, the question is, what operating systems will be um, supported in the future? Um, so today there's, uh, there's CentOS. Um, and there's uh, another derivative that's very familiar to most people, which I'm not allowed to, to say. Um, but you can go find it. We call it a G cell, but it looks very familiar to something else. Uh, we will be providing more, you know, more operating systems in the future outside of, you know, Linux derivatives at some point when it makes sense. Um, part of that's going to come from demand from customers. But yes, it does make sense to support more in the future at some point. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I heard the uh, uh, Hada, Hadapu was was um, Hadoop. The, can you comment a little bit? Do you use that? Or maybe you, you don't want to say that. Uh, the other the other question is, um, I heard the Google App Engine support Python, Go. Um, do you plan to support Pro? 
Where which? Pearl. Pearl. Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, I can't say anything about future features, um, but we have heard many times that PHP is popular, um, Perl is popular. Hey, you know, could you just work your Google magic and do all this automatic scaling with any you know language we bring? Um, we've heard it. Um, I can't say anything more than that right now, but yes, we recognize that it's really important. So that, that was one question. The other one is around Hadoop. Um, we actually, I believe we have some white papers around how to run Hadoop really well on top of Compute Engine. Um, and it makes sense that a lot of uh, cloud providers have provided like software that makes it even faster, and we definitely recognize that too. But I can't, I can't say if something is coming or not. But I can, I can tell you, yes, we recognize the need for, for both of those. So, Thank you. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is there like a um, long time ago there used to be um, grid computing and stuff like that? Um, and peer to peer and things like this. Um, is it possible that peer, if one's doing peer to peer for gaming, some of the assets could be in the cloud and then for some reason, uh, I mean, mainly it would be running peer to peer, but say like if there's a fallout, then you can pull from the cloud. Yeah, so the question is, is, you know, will you start to see models of how you leverage like access? From the phone and fell over to the, you know, fell over the cloud or using the cloud. In fact, we actually do a lot to make this possible. This is one of the things for the Google endpoints to make programming easier. Um, we also have things in App Engine like task queues, XMPP. We have this thing called the channel API, which will call back into your cell phone to deliver notifications. So there's a lot of social sites out there that use App Engine where you're walking around and it's sending like, you know, GPS location or whatever to their app. And then it's like, oh, hey, you have three of your best friends right next door. And that's all built on top of the services and app engine. So absolutely what you're asking for is there, and it's getting used. Thank you. Yep. Just as a curiosity, when you upload or, uh, or you access a street view image on the computer, how many machines do you have working <laughs> in a typical browsing like street view image? Yeah, so the question is, is uh, when you're doing like Street View, how many machines are, are back there working on that? I can't tell you. But what's interesting is, is in the last year, Google used to have this thing called tile servers, and we'd serve out these tiles. We actually moved away from that now, um, and we're actually rendering now in the browser. So we're sending the data, um, and we're allowing you to cache it locally on the phone. So if you suddenly drive out of, you know, Wi-Fi area, the, the map keeps working for you. Um, on the back end of that, go look at the Google data centers. And we tell you like where all the Google data centers are all over the world, and you can just start to like, wow, there's probably a lot of servers out there handling things like Gmail and Maps. Um, maps in particular is heavy with data. So I can't tell you, but it's probably a big number. <laughs> so. All right, so I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, you know, uh, thank you, Tony, also for taking your time to, uh, to educate us on all these things. Um, there are quite a few Google people around. If any of you have questions uh, for any of us, we're all wearing Google shirts. Uh, Tony's also going to make himself available for the next few minutes to answer any questions. Thanks again, everybody.